Hey, thank you every, everyone for coming here today, and thank you uh, in particular to our speaker, who is Dr. Sadia Bouchard, as you all know. Uh, she's trained as a historian and curator, and I have just learned is also uh, involved in the making of a black and white film on Japanese mysticism, so watch this space. She will be back with her film one day, perhaps. Uh, okay, she, she obtained her PhD in history from the VU University of Amsterdam in 2014. The research focused on the concept of intangible heritage, and more specifically on dynamics of heritage formation and the performance practices of the Wayang Puppet Theater in colonial and post-colonial Indonesia. She contributed to the exhibition that I hope you have all seen, or that you all have, or you will be headed there um, tomorrow morning, first thing. Uh, Shadow Puppet Theater from Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand, which is currently on show at the British Museum, and we have the curator for the show dishes um, here with us as well. Uh, she's curated many other things. I won't go through all of that. Um, in 2013, she was fellow at the Institute for the Study of Human Rights at Columbia in New York. So uh, this is the first of our proper seminars. We have the, the, uh, the centenary event um, with the Center for Southeast Asian Studies last week. Uh, but this is the first of our proper seminars. So thank you for helping us get it off to a good start. And her talk today is entitled, as you see, Politics at Play, Indonesian Wayang Performance Practice and Heritage Politics. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sidi Alashar. Thanks for uh, this introduction, and uh, thank you all for coming out this afternoon. And I've heard that some people are a little bit sleepy, so I try to make you not fall asleep. Um, so yes, today I would like to talk to you about Indonesian um, heritage politics uh, in the case of uh, Wayang. And um, I wasn't actually sure who who actually who is or who isn't familiar with Wayang. So who has ever seen a live Wayang performance? Oh, so that's quite a few people. Okay, that's great. Okay, but for those of you who don't, who are not so familiar with Wayang, I thought, okay, I'll just uh, um, give you a very brief summary of what it is. So, <coughs> the word Wayang can actually mean um, in Indonesian a performance or a puppet or a theater, and it's basically a traditional theater that is mainly played on Java, Bali, and Lombok. Uh, it has already been around since the ninth century and. Um, it is a, a kind of theater that tells stories uh, with the support of a gamelan orchestra, uh, so with the help of music. And uh, the gamelan is, um, is an orchestra that consists of percussion instruments. Um, and shows generally last for eight hours, from um, eight um, in the evening until four in the morning. And um, um, the central figure is the dalang, and you can see him here in the middle of the picture, sitting in front of the screen. Uh, he sits there for eight hours, cross-legged, and he uh, manipulates the puppets. He also tells the story, and he sings the songs, and he also orchestrates, um, uh, directs the, the orchestra sitting in front of him. So here you see a kind of a, a traditional setup of a, a wine stage. Uh, you see also here um, the singers, and uh, in front of that, uh, the gamelan orchestra. So, um, in Indonesia, you can nowadays watch the performance from both sides of the screen. So, you can either watch it from this side, so that you can see the dalang and the colorful puppets and the sindan, so the singers and the orchestra, but you can also walk around the screen and then you get to see um, the shadows of the intricately, intricately carved puppets. So today, the most popular forms are actually the wayang kulit, which is played with the flat shadow puppets, and Wayang Golek, which is played with uh, three-dimensional rod puppets without a screen. Um, so if we talk about heritage, uh, uh, in the case of Wayang, um, a very important event happened in 2003, when Wayang was proclaimed as a masterpiece of the oral and intangible heritage uh, of humanity. Uh, of humanity. Um, <coughs> so this was a big event um, that happened to Wayang, um, and um, it happened within the framework of um, this program called the Masterpieces, uh, the Masterpiece Program, uh, launched by UNESCO to uh, kind of uh, give the concept of intangible heritage a boost. And in the same year, the Convention of Intangible Heritage was um, uh, adopted by uh, UNESCO. 
So um, <clears throat> the program entailed that nation states, uh, member nation states of the UN, uh, could apply or could uh, submit uh, cultural expressions to be proclaimed uh, a UNESCO masterpiece. Uh, so this happened biannually. In 2001, the first masterpieces were pro proclaimed, and in 2003 was the second batch of masterpieces, including the Wayang uh, Puppet Theatre of Indonesia. So the criteria that were applied um, were set out in a very elaborate uh, guideline consisting of 37 pages, but I condensed them into these points. So one, uh, one of them was um, uh, this cultural expression had to be of universal value, it had to be endangered, it, has, it had to have some important historical roots, it had to affirm um, uh, an identity, it had to be an, of excellent quality, and it had to be unique. So that is what basically uh, could qualify potentially as, um, as a masterpiece. <coughs> So in the case of Indonesia, the nomination file was prepared by two organizations. The one is Senowangi, which is um, uh, the National Wayang Secretariat for uh, Wayang. And the other one was Papali, which is the National uh, Dalang um, Association. So the Dalang is the Wayang puppeteer. So uh, what is important to know about these organizations is that these were established in the late 1970s during Soharto's new order. They were actually founded by uh, a military commander called Surono. Um, at first they had another name, uh, but later they uh, turned into Senawangi and Papadi. Um, and this uh, commander um, was also responsible for the es establishment of an ethical code for the Dalang. So this all happened in, uh, during um, um, Suharto's regime, 32 years of uh, uh, Suharto's new order, uh, after the events of 1965. So um, I interpret it in, in the sense that um, these organizations were trying to uh, exercise greater control um, on Dalang and the wild performance practice. So these organizations, the location, the offices are located uh, also at uh, Tamamini Indonesia, Indonesia Inda. So which means um, um, Beautiful Indonesian in uh, beautiful Indonesia in miniature. So it's um, this kind of um, entertainment park, uh, which is a reflection, which should reflect the unity in diversity. So the slogan of Suharto's uh, new order. So the idea was that every province, every region in Indonesia would get um, uh, an area within the park, within within the theme park. Uh, where their uh, regional dance was displayed, where they had a regional house, where they had a niche, uh, regional song, textiles, etc. So this was kind of a straight jacket which uh, was applied to, uh, to the theme park. In case, for example, a region didn't have a dance or textile, then it was invented. <laughs> So the park is very much also an uh, invention of tradition. It was really as a, a promotion of Suharto's cultural policy of uh, unity and diversity. So these two organizations that have their roots in, um, in, this, um, in the 1970s, in Suharto's new order, is, are still located in this, um, in this location. And also the boards of these organizations are still very much um, uh, related to um, new order power structures. So that is something that I think is very particular about this uh, nomination file. So these two organizations together worked on this nomination file and the nomination file kind of is basically a, dis a description of what Wyan is. So um, if we look at the, at the nomination file itself, um, only five forms of Wayang are described. So basically, as you probably know, there are lots of uh, varieties of Wayang uh, throughout Indonesia. Uh, nobody actually knows how many, but um, maybe tens or hundreds of different forms of Wayang. So the nomination file only describes these five forms. So there's Wayang Bali from Bali, Wayang Kulit Purwa from Java, Wayang Golek from West Java. And as examples for Wayang forms that are um, threatened with uh, distinction. Uh, Wayang Banja from South Kalimantan was described, as well as Wayang Palembang from South Sulawesi. So these forms were 
um, 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 described um, in dire need of preservation to kind of fit the criteria of UNESCO that it had to be an endangered uh, cultural form. But if we look at uh, what the nomination file is actually about, then we see something completely different. So there's this foreword that was written by Sena Wangi, and I wanted to uh, read with you, go with you through some of the quotes in uh, that foreword, because I think it's very revealing of the actual purpose of the, the nomination file. So the first quote is, the vision of Sena Wangi is a desire to make Wayang one of the pillars of national culture. End of quote. And then another quote. Why you may be advanced further to become a cultural asset of the world. End of quote. Another quote. The great attention which has been directed to Wayang by the government of Indonesia and UNESCO is extremely useful and valuable. End of quote. And then the last quote. Wayang will appear and be recognized as a cultural masterpiece of the world. This appreciation is a source of pride for the Indonesian people." End of quote. So actually, um, all there, there is this foreword and uh, some other letters as an introduction to the nomination file. So from these, um, from these letters, from these forewords, it becomes actually clear that it's not so much it, the nomination file for Indonesia does not have that much to do with the preservation or the wish to preserve Wayang as a cultural expression, but it's mainly used um, to kind of instill pride for the Indonesian people, but also to turn Wayang into a national uh, form of culture. Um, and they use UNESCO as an interna international platform to achieve basically this domestic identity building. What Sena Wangi and Papadi also do is they define, they try to define what Wayang is. So in the 19, um, during Saharta's New Order, they already established uh, an ethical code for the Dalang. And um, in, um, in the nomination file, they also claim that Wayang should be, um, uh, um, that Wayang is, uh, how Wayang is defined. So, they say philosophical values are the main content and power of Wayang performance, and also Wayang is not simply entertainment. And today I think there's not so much time to go really into the historical roots of this heritage discourse, but basically these elements, uh, the emphasis on philosophical as well as mystical values, goes back to colonial times when uh, the Dutch colonial elite was interacting <coughs> with, a, with a Javanese elite, and from that, um, distilled this idea of, uh, of Wayang being philo uh, philosophical and mystical and spiritual, etc., etc. Other elements, such as the entertain, uh, entertaining element, were rendered more to the background and, um, and were regarded as of lesser importance. So this kind of discourse was already established in the 1930s during the colonial times and has been incorporated and reauthorized within UNESCO's um, understanding and definition of Wayang. Um, <clears throat> so for me, um, during my research, one of the questions that arose from, from all of this was uh, how do contemporary Dalang actually deal with all of this? Because then you have on the one side all these people who are trying to make uh, Wayang policies and they try to decide what Wayang should be or uh, or what it is, or, or whatever, but how do actual uh, Wayang practitioners uh, deal with this, and how do they shape and create uh, their Wayang practice? So what I did is that I uh, uh, spent over a year uh, doing fieldwork in, in, in Java. I was based in Yogyakarta, and I was following around three superstar Dalang. And um, with uh, superstar Dalang, I mean Dalang who are of uh, meaning to uh, a wider, to actually a real mass audience. So they're not just known and meaningful to, um, to for example, their local town, but they're meaningful throughout the whole Indonesian archipelago. And in the cases of the three Dalang that I uh, followed, also abroad. So, and then what you see then is that they apply lots of different strategies. So the strategy of this one, Kipurba Asmoro, and Ki is actually, it's not a name, it's a title, which means the honorable. 
Um, he was born in 1966 in Surakarta, and uh, he's become, um, um, over the past 10 years, I would say he has become very popular, and he is uh, becoming increasingly popular today. And uh, in 2012, he performed at the Asia Society in New York. And um, if you look at this, so this is um, uh, Kipurbo um, is accompanied often by a lady who acts as his manager, and she also often translates his performances directly from Javanese into English to make it more accessible to international audiences. So here you see one slide of her translation. So this is uh, a part of the clown scene in which Garen is talking to Petruk and Garen says, listen to all that clapping, what's going on out here? What are they clapping about? And then Pet Petruk answers, they love Wayang, which has been acknowledged by UNESCO as a world masterpiece. So here you see very clearly that he uses, uh, he uses the UNESCO masterpiece as a frame of reference for his work. And he also told me in, um, I've seen many of his performances, of course, also in Indonesia, and he often, uh, almost in all of his performances, he mentions that Wayang has been proclaimed a masterpiece. And in the interviews and conversations that I've had with him, him he also told me that um, it makes him feel, this proclamation makes him feel proud of Wayang, and it, it also makes him feel, uh, really want to kind of step up his game and, um, and um, live up to the ex expectations and really give his best uh, for Wayang. So you see that in the case of Kipurba Asmoro, he's really directly influenced by uh, this uh, proclamation. Um, Ki Mantap Sudar Sono is another Dalang. I think, uh, I think him and another Dalang, Ki Anam Suroto, they are like the two most famous puppeteers of Indonesia. He's a bit older, he was born in 1948, but also from Surakarta, so central Java. Um, and um, he has become <coughs> popular in the late 1980s and 1990s under influence and the emergence of mass media. So at that time there were lots of cassettes uh, circulating and people were buying um, um, cassettes with wine recordings um, that lasted um, so then you would have like a set of eight cassettes that would um, uh, would have recorded the whole wine performance uh, he also performed a lot on TV so he became very popular um, in 1992 he was lucky enough to uh, sign an exclusive contract with Oscar Don and Oscar Don is a kind of a pharmaceutical um, um, company which sells its products all over Indonesia, so from Sumatra to Papua. So everybody, um, uh, so then uh, Kimante became the face of Oscar Don since 1992. So it's an ex actually an exclusive contract with Oscar Don. So that means that every two years they um, um, they create a new advertisement they create a new marketing campaign. So this is one of the posters, but it also involves uh, um, print ads, radio ads, and uh, a TV ad, which I would like to show you. So let's see if how this goes. Yeah, so this this ad is is actually um, is broadcasted uh, more or less ten times a day on eleven national chan channels throughout Indonesia, and then there are also uh, two hundred radio channels in which you can also hear Mantep um, sell Oscar Don. So his name is known everywhere, even in the places where there's not even Wayang. So, uh, for example, in this ad. Um, 
you can recognize him as a dalang, but like in previous commercials, you would still see him on um, on a stage setting. So they would uh, they would film him. So they would film the commercial on an actual wire stage. But in this uh, in this commercial, he is it's a kind of kung fu kind of setting. Uh, so he's not even actually in the role of a Dalang any longer because his name has already become so famous and intertwined with Oscar Don. So this commercial contract with uh, Oscar Don has made him really seriously very famous throughout Indonesia. And, um, um, and in that sense, he kind of has become the standard for Wayang. So if people, when people think of Wayang in Indonesia, they think of Mantep. Um, so he has become the standard for, uh, for Wayang and was then selected by Senawangi in Papadi to represent the Dalang community uh, at the um, UNESCO ceremony in Paris in 2003. And uh, Mantep as well uh, refers uh, often in his performances uh, to the master proclamation, um, to the proclamation of masterpieces, and also he then mentions that he has been sent and selected by Sinawangi to actually attend the, the ceremony of the proclamations. So, in that sense, um, uh, also Mantep um, really makes very direct references to and also makes use of this procla proclamation uh, by UNESCO. But then, of course, there are also Dalang who do it differently. And one of them um, is Kiyantusus Mono. So Kiyantusus Mono uh, was born in the same year as the first Dalang that we saw, as Kipurbo, in, 19, in 1966. But Kiyantus is from a different region. So he's from Tagal, which is at the north coast of Java. So a bit of a different culture than um, in, in, in Surakarta. So um, he's widely regarded as an um, uh, innovator, uh, extreme innovator. So. Uh, his fans, they're, they're really fond of him and call him Dalang Edan, the crazy Dalang, or the Dalang Cowboy, the Cowboy Dalang. But of course he has lots of opponents too, who call him the Dalang Kassar, the Ru Dalang, and also call him the destroyer of Wayang. Because they think his innovations, uh, with his innovations he really crosses many, many boundaries. Um, so, if we look at his innovations, is what he does, he innovates his in actually many areas. So he, um, he um, every year he commissions new musical comp compositions for his shows. Uh, he innovates in the storyline. So he can um, start a story with a flashback. So you see someone get killed in the first scene and then the story unfolds from there uh, instead of uh, an opening court scene at the palace, etc. He also um, innovates in language. He not only uses uh, old Javanese, Kavi, uh, he also uses colloquial uh, Javanese, he also uses Bahasa Indonesia uh, or Arabic. Uh, whatever he seems fit for that particular moment, he would use. Um, he also innovates in uh, genre, so he creates lots of new. Uh, genre, uh, to which I will come back later. Um, so he does all of that, and what he, what is also um, uh, typical for him is that since he is uh, from Tagal, which is uh, kind of on the border between West Java and Central Java, he plays both Wayang Kulit, as you see here, and Wayang Golek. And in the case of Wayang Kulit, by the way, here you see that he also plays with a, a half a uh, round screen, so instead of a rectangular big screen. So he often also combines these forms in one show. So then he starts with, for example, Wayang Kulit, and then changes to Wayang Golek, and then goes back to the screen again. Um, and there are not many uh, puppeteers who, who, can, who actually master both uh, of these forms. Um, as you can see here, his performances uh, attract really thousands of spectators. Sometimes uh, you go to these shows, and when I first went to one of these shows, I really had no clue what I was to expect. And I came there, and there were so many people everywhere. And it's like a huge gathering of these people, and there are always all these food stalls around it. It's like a, a night market, basically. So you go there, it's a night market, and the performance is part of that. So it's always in the open air. And um, when there are thousands of spectators like this, then they put up big screens throughout the field so that people from everywhere can uh, follow the screen on 
these screens, just like in other pop concerts, etc. Um, so what he also does is uh, he's very innovative in his creation of puppets. So he actually draws his own puppets and then he has a team of puppet makers that actually make the puppets, uh, that make the puppets because he doesn't have time. But he al always draws them uh, himself, first on paper and then on the buffalo hide. Um, and he creates new puppets like this. So can you rec who recognize this one? Yeah, it's a Teletubby. It's Samar as a Teletubby. Still recognizable very much as, as Samar, but then as a Teletubby. So he made all the, the clowns into a Teletubby. Batman. Very recognizable. Okay, so this is a little bit older, but he also incorporates political figures. So I don't know if you can still recognize him. George Bush, yes. <laughs> George Bush and his enemy, Saddam Hussein. Oh, oh, sorry. Yes. And um, this is Wayang with a human face, which he calls Wayang Rai Wong. And I forgot to point that out earlier when we saw his photo, uh, his portrait. Um, but this is actually him. So, um, as you've seen, like most of the wine puppets are very stylized, so they don't actually, well, even there are representations of, uh, of humans, but uh, they're hardly recognizable as a, as a human being. So he thought, I want to make uh, puppets with a human face, because he also sometimes teaches at, um, at uh, primary schools, and then once he went to a school with his puppets, and the kids didn't recognize the puppet, they thought, uh, one of the kids asked him, like, who's this bird? And then he was like, what do you mean? This is not a bird, it's, it's, it's a person, it's a human being, it's a, it's a character, how do you not know that? But then he went home and then he thought, well, okay, if, if the kids think that it's a bird, then you know, there's something going wrong here. So he thought, why don't I just make um, puppets that are recognizable as a human being? So he made a set of um, uh, Wyon with uh, human faces and he, and he also made a puppet of himself as Bima because he likes Bima very much is one of his favorite characters and he likes to identify with him. So, um, as you can imagine, not everyone appreciates these kinds of innovations and um, what's more, he also uh, innovates in performance styles. So what you see here is, is lots of spectacle, uh, lots of colored lights and, um, um, well, we've already seen the puppet as a mirror image. Um, but um, there's also something else within his performance style. He really, he has also this background in theater. So he incorporates also theatrical elements within, um, uh, within the Wyong show. So I also would like to show you a very short clip of that, of what he does. <laughs> Okay, so what you see here is that, so sometimes he has these puppets that are his mirror images and then he, he um, incorporates them in the story, but in this case he incorporates himself in the story. Uh, so he also does that and even just the standing up and fighting, standing up by itself is already uh, considered very rude to many um, um, uh, young lovers, so, so to say. So, um, why he, um, Kintu says that he makes these innovations to, to reach new audiences because uh, he thinks that, um, okay, so uh, why is maybe not as popular as it used to be with, uh, uh, with Indonesians. So he thinks, I have to reach out and make people interested in Wayang again. So that's why he makes these new forms, these forms that are recognizable to kids 
but also um, he really wants to, uh, he really strives to make his show very interesting uh, spectacles basically. He wants to make spectacular shows to entice the audiences and that's why he keeps innovating to keep to um, come up with new things every time so that, that, that the audiences don't get bored. Um, and also his ideas is that, you know, once he turns these shows into something really spectacular, it makes it easier for the audiences to also kind of um, uh, get access to the more ph philosophical and mystical elements of Wayang. So that is his reasoning behind those innovations. Another thing why Kintus also stands out is that he's very um, socially and politically engaged. So what he used to do in his performances is um, criticize the Bupati, the regent of his hometown, Tagal, uh, openly uh, because, uh, because of corruption and, and all sorts of mismanagement within the region. Uh, so this was kind of a, a void between Kiantus and the, and the local Bupati. Um, so much so that at one point in 2008, 2008 Kiantus was imprisoned. Uh, on the instigation that he had, um, on the accusation that he had instigated a rally at some local uh, radio station. But because of lack of evidence, Kian Tus had to be released after 75 days, so that's still quite a long time, three Japanese months. Uh, and he was just in time released to be present at the opening of an exhibition devoted especially to him at the Trope Museum in Amsterdam. So this exhibition was called, uh, entitled, Wayang Superstar, the Theatre World of Kiantusus Mono. So like, Kiantus had been released two days prior uh, to the opening, so he was present at the opening, and then later in the year he performed, he gave two shows uh, at the Tropen Theatre. And this whole exhibition focused on Kiantus, on his innovations, on his puppet creations, etc. Um, then after this, he went back to uh, Indonesia and he adopted this international recognition and also the name of the exhibition for his own P PR and marketing uh, purposes. So here you see his car with um, Wang Superstar, Kian Tusus Mono, um, and then his website underneath. Um, Here again, this is just a big banner. Um, they, they put these big banners always up before, uh, before a show. Um, he also organized, um, he also used this of course as a moment for uh, press coverage. So he organized a press conference as, at his home. So this is at his home. So you see him here again with another puppet who is his mirror image and the posters of the, of the exhibition and the theater. And this is the press um, interviewing him. And then after that, um, he designed another new genre, a new genre, which became really important for him. And this is, this is called Wayang Santri. He um, created this in 2010. And um, this became um, instantly very popular because the shows are much shorter. They only last, um, they can last from about two hours until four or six hours, whatever the sponsor asks for. So he, if, if the sponsor asks for a show of six hours, it's fine. If he asks for four or five, it's also fine. He will, uh, he will do, um, Key and Tuz will cater to that, to whatever the sponsor is asking for. So um, this genre of Wayang Santri um, is not following one of the more, more traditional story cycles, but um, it's basically uh, uh, more rooted in local stories and daily life. Um, and what he does is that he, uh, he blends Islamic messages also within, in, into these uh, stories. And as you can see, the singers are dressed up differently, and um, they, um, uh, there are Islamic chants, there are Islamic instruments being used in the orchestra, and there are Islamic songs, and um, I wanted to also show you um, one of those, one of that as an example. Um, this looks weird, but I think it should.
I think you get you get an idea. So actually, this show uh, I saw just last August, sixth uh, August in um, East Java, Pasuruan, and the singer, this singer, is actually not a, a Wayan singer, but she's a Dangdut singer. So from a completely different genre again. Um, so what he does is he invites um, uh, famous singers, also outside the Wayan genre, to perform within his uh, within his um, shows. Uh, and what she's singing is a traditional Islamic song, um, and as you see, yeah, it, it really the whole show is a kind of um, a big spectacle, and with very long clownsies, there there is actually hardly any real story within in, within those shows. Um, so there is this, there is the Islamic chants, there is Islamic songs, and then there are also. Um, very many uh, um, uh, coarse and crude and rude jokes um, uh, throughout this Wayang Santri. So here, what you see here is one of his most famous puppets. He's called Babuk, the drunken puppet. Um, and you see him here, Babuk drinking from his bottle of whatever it is, uh, beer or whatever. And um, he, he also turns these scenes into very long scenes of Babuk being drunk and then bothering other people and then at one point uh, peeing in his own bottle and then forgetting that he has peed in his bottle and then drink from it again and um, etc. So all of this is combined in this uh, Islamic genre of Wayang Santri um, and um, at first I thought well this is a bit peculiar but actually nobody seemed to care and, and the whole audience uh, as you see here is always having, um, having a great time and they really um, yeah, they really feel entertained and they, they take pictures and they make videos and, um, and they always also stay until the end. Um, so with this Wayang Santri, he has become very popular because, because the, the shows are so short, he was able to travel a lot with these shows. Because if you only perform two hours, you can actually do two shows in one night, in one evening. So he did that. So he went mostly around his hometown, Tagal, with Wayang Santri and building a huge fan base. And as I said, he also incorporated these Islamic messages. So he often also um, uh, performed as a um, Dalang Dakwa, as an uh, um, Islamic teacher. So here is what, uh, here's, uh, you see him here again as a Dalang Dakwa, um, gathering these masses of people together so he did that for over a year and he became really, really popular. And um, <coughs> then in 2012, 2013, he decided to run himself for Bupati of Tagal. With Wayang Santri, he was campaigning and with his Dalang uh, Wayang Dakwa, he was campaigning to become a Bupati uh, in a very successful way because he actually became the regent of Tagal in 2014. And so currently he's actually still a Bupati ruling the region of Tagal until 2019. So he still has three more years in his pocket, well, two and a half years. Um, he actually still uh, works as a Dalang as well. So during the week he's a Bupati and he works on, uh, he focuses on his governmental job. And in the weekends he, um, he still performs as a Dalang. So this was also on the same, uh, during the same performances, performance in August um, that you just saw the Dangdut singer. Um, and what happened here is that before the show actually started, he gave um, a speech. Um, so actually it was kind of unclear whether he was here as a Dalang or as a Bupati. And so these two roles merged in him and he was, um, it was also unclear whether the political message that he 
that he, uh, the, the speech that he gave was his own um, message or that of the sponsor. So that was kind of unclear. But um, um, I think that is very interesting to see that now that he's Bupati, he has, he has really created this platform also for himself as a politician. And then after the speech, he came, he went back, uh, went behind the screen and uh, did his performance with all these jokes and fun and whatever, and uh, okay. with lots of new puppets, as you see here, very mm -hmm. weird creation with a watermelon shaped uh, puppet. And so he, ha he always has, whenever I see him, he, he, ca he has new puppets and new creations. Um, so, to conclude, I think that if we look at the politics at play in Wayang, I think that if we uh, go back to the international UNESCO heritage discourse, it really anchors Wayang in a national discourse of identity politics. And this discourse is very much rooted in a new order, uh, new order power structures and discourses of culture and Wayang. And UNESCO, as a standard setting organization, with a global authority in the field of cultural heritage, authorizes established guidelines for Wayang performance tradition. Uh, consequently, anyone who will read the nomination file is very likely to evaluate and judge Wayang uh, along those guidelines and to also judge the Wayang performance practice by it. So the result is that uh, approaches or perspectives that kind of fall outside the description of UNESCO's nomination file uh, are judge, judged as not correct, or, um, or maybe not even Wayang. So in that sense, the UNESCO proclamation functions as some sort of a controlling force that establishes guidelines and also rules for Wayang. Uh, but what you see then in what happens in practice is that individual Dalang, they bend the rules, they <coughs> adapt the rules, they always find ways to circumvent the rules. Of course, we've seen also Purbo who actually uh, uses uh, and complies to the rules that have been set uh, and Mantap, Mantap has become uh, representative of uh, the rules and guidelines that have been set. Uh, that have been set. Um, but Key and Tuz really chooses a different, uh, different approach to this and um, he chooses a more subversive and challenging, challenging um, uh, position towards dominant discourse by creating these new puppets, these new genres, etc. And uh, if you look at audience uh, uh, reception of this, is that they really appreciate it, they really enjoy uh, his new creations and his creativity and whatever he's doing. So that has made him very popular. But then Key and Tuz then, I think it's interesting, is that um, his subver subversive buying practice has enabled him to become actually political establishment. Um, so in that sense, I think those politics at play at uh, Wayang are very dynamic and also very complex. And um, in this case, I think what you see is that the heritage discourse influences Wayang performance practice very directly and vice versa, because um, they, I think what you see is they mutually and simultaneously challenge, uh, but also reinforce each other. And that is all what I wanted to share with you today. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for a fascinating talk. I'm sure there will be many questions. Yeah. Other question. You talked about the criteria. So one of the things you know, the criteria is, mm -hmm. is endangered. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just wondering what were some of the threats? I mean, obviously you see this huge crowds coming up with these performances. Yeah. What were some of the threats, basically? Well, so for example, the two forms of wiring that, that were described in the, in the nomination file, they're actually non-existent anymore. There is maybe one Dalang for wiring Banjar, uh, but that's it. So uh, those kind of forms, so there are many forms that are actually dying out. Uh, there are many forms that already have died out. But as you can see in the case of Wayang Kulit and Wayang Golik, I think it's still, it's still very popular um, because um, these Dalang, they perform um, two or three times a week each, and they're not there. And then there are two other dalang at the same level. So maybe you can see these dalang as like triple A status, like really the top-notch dalang. So they all perform like two or three times, maybe four times a week. 
um, throughout Indonesia, wherever. Then there is also this level of B Dalang and C Dalang who also perform, maybe not so often as these do, but it means that there is still like hundreds of performances going on uh, everywhere. So, and if you go, uh, yeah, so the, the shows that attract thousands of people are really big shows, but normal shows would, would still attract uh, hundreds of people. So, in that sense, I am really not so afraid that it would die out during our, our lifetime. I really don't see that happening uh, in that sense. But of course, there are these obscure forms of wiring that will die out. I mean, if Kian Tus would stop performing wiring Santri, I'm not sure if somebody else would take over or, or would also be able to perform um, uh, in that genre. So, that is kind of what, what is happening um, as I, how I see it anyway. Yeah. And it has been recognized as uh, an important part of Indonesian heritage. Yeah. Are there not organizations to ensure its conservation and that it is continued? Yeah. So actually part of the nomination file, oh maybe I forgot to tell you that, but the nomination file consisted of the nomination file itself and then a 10 minute documentary. And then um, they also had to submit an action plan, a five year action plan on how to preserve it. So the idea of the intangible uh, of the um, of this program was to um, preserve uh, and safeguard intangible heritage. So the uh, emphasis more on uh, the transfer of knowledge. So the action plan describes this plan to work more with wine workshops because uh, many of these very famous dalang they have like a workshop where um, where where they have puppet um, puppet makers working there, but also uh, people who would like to become a dalang they study there with them etc. to also work. Uh, so the idea that was proposed to UNESCO was to work more with these kind of workshops. And there, then there are also these arts, Indonesian arts institutes, where um, the art of Dalang, Padalangan, is being taught. So uh, also to work more with them. But um, those workshops work very well because um, usually Wayang is, is um, um, yeah, if you want to become a Dalang, you would study with a real Dalang in his workshop and just maybe not in his workshop, you would just go to him and then work with him uh, maybe on a performance or whatever, you would just go to his house and hang out a lot with him and then practice with him uh, the music, um, the man manipulation of the puppets. But the uh, Indonesian art institutions is a different kind of thing because that is um, actually, um, um, yeah, how do you say that? Um, so the level after high school, so you would go there to study the art of Dalang. So that is actually more meant to uh, train um, um, art critics. Uh, but you can also go there, if you want to become a Dalang, you can also go there. But if you start uh, practicing Wayang by the time that you're 18 or 19 or 20, then it's just less likely that you become a really good Dalang. So in that sense, the transfer of knowledge is there, but then in, in a very academic way. So there you can learn, you know, what the rules, what the guidelines are, etc. And with the Dalang himself, you can learn uh, how it's actually done, basically. I don't know if this answers your question. Mm -hmm. Apprenticeships yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, in terms of the political uh, physical engagement of the practitioner, I'm just is it a transnational problem? Is there any capacity in which it could become more linked with a transnational set of identities and issues, or is it, is it because of the inherent regionalism that the UNESCO guide provides? Is it? Mm. Uh, so you never meet. I'm not sure if I actually understand your question. So, with, with why I'm being a transnational problem, because in, uh, as I understand in Thailand, yeah. there's a similar thing with why I'm being deployed politically. Yeah. Is there any capacity in which wine could be transnationally deployed as a political oh. medium? As a political medium? Yeah. Okay, so if wine could be used as a political medium transnationally? Yeah. Mm, well... It's sort of, I think, you know, maybe some idea. I think in the, the case of UNESCO, kind of, it already does that. I mean, wine is being utilized um, by... Um, the Javanese majority within Indonesia to have it recognized by an international institution uh, to become a national 
form of culture. The interesting thing, for example, in the case of this um, intangible, uh, these masterpiece proclamations and the concept of intangible heritage is that, um, so Wayang was the first Indonesian masterpiece, then it was Batik and then Chris. And then only after that it was Anklung and then I think also Noken and some other, um, some other forms. So, but the first three, um, uh, first three proclamations or master, uh, uh, recogni acknowledged masterpieces were all Japanese. So in my view, that's really, it, it, that is already a very political thing to do and um, to use Wayang, Batik and Chris as a medium to gain uh, political recognition on a domestic level for a Japanese majority within Indonesia. But isn't it also UNESCO that's using those national needs to make its own international platform? I mean, they, they, yes. they, this is not a unique case of UNESCO uh, yeah, exploiting exactly. a, a national agenda yeah. um, or a particular national agenda. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I agree with you. And I, and I think it has to do just with the whole structure of the UN, because mm -hmm. that is how the UN is built. It's built on the member, uh, the nation state membership. So they work with national governments. But if you look at the no, uh, nomination file, then, then I think, well, they, sometimes I think, well, they, they could be a little bit more critical about um, in what way the, the file is written, for example. It's not because if you look at the nomination file, the, the, the nomination files for the masterpieces are still, um, I don't know if you can say that, but they're classified, so they're still not open for research yet. They will open, I think, in uh, 2020, so we still have to wait for a few more years. Because at the time that they were developing um, this masterpiece program, the concept of intangible heritage was not very well defined. So they were trying to kind of um, give the concept of intangible heritage an incentive by adopting this program. So that means that probably, or that's my assumption, that these um, deliberations about what should be proclaimed as a masterpiece or not was not so very well regulated. So um, I think in, in that sense, um, I don't know how it is now. I don't know how, how, they, uh, uh, how they evaluate these nomina nomination files now. But if I look at the why nomination file, then, then I find it, it's not an, it's not, uh, an academic um, piece of writing um, in any way. It's just basically a repetition of assumptions and stereotypes um, about what Wayang is and what it should be. So it's a very self-referential sort of discourse, I feel, that is, um, yeah, in, in my view, uh, not critically uh, examined by UNESCO. So that is a little bit what I find, that is what UNESCO should, is could do is in a better unusual? way. Sorry? Is that unusual? I don't know. I don't. I haven't. I, d I don't know what other nomination files look like. But um, this is what I really, uh, yeah. What really, um, what yeah. What struck me when going through this nomination file for Wyong. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's intensely bureaucratic. Sorry. They're intensely bureaucratic. Yes. Of course. Yes. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Um, yes. No. It appears, if you look at it critically, that they're trying to manipulate the people by, of course, spreading their ideals and yeah. through their values. Do you think perhaps UNESCO's kind of in intervention in a way is to try and influence sort of society in general, maybe? From the other, pff, no. Well, I don't think so, actually. <laughs> Not, well, in the, in the case of Wyong, well, maybe yes and no. I mean, it, it depends on how you look at it, right? I mean, um, so the action plan is, is important. Um, um, but sometimes I also feel that, so that is where UNESCO would have an influence in the execution of the action plans on how to preserve and safeguard Wayang uh, in Java. But if you look at the actual <coughs> action plan, um, it doesn't really regulate so much. It only um, identifies these workshops uh, with which they will work and uh, Indonesian art institutions, but they don't, for example, uh, uh, they don't require a curriculum or something. So it's still kind of free. So in that sense, I think not so much in that way. It's, it's, 
yeah, what I get from the nomination file is more that this, these organizations in the Wangi and Papali really try to push their own agenda by using uh, this international recognition. Yes. How much or how little do, I guess, those sort of museums, like the colonial collection museums in Europe, have a part to play in the nominations or that process? I mean, is it, do they aid it at all or do they actually hinder it? Or Mm. Um, as far as I know, um, no museums were well. No museums outside Indonesia were involved in the preparation of the nomination file and the proclamation. Of co course, what you do see is that in the case of Kintus and what also happens in the case of other Dalang is that once they um, have performed elsewhere, or uh, in the case of Kintus, he had this exhibition in the Throat Museum in Amsterdam. So he really they use that international recognition at home to uplift their own status and prestige. So that is very clear. So also in the nomination file, they, they also write, uh, Wayang has been um, researched by many international people and it's worthwhile for many international researchers, etc., etc. So this international recognition is very, very important um, to, uh, to also promote Wayang at home, basically. Mm -hmm. But they, uh, as far as I know, museums and, and, and uh, inter you know, outside Indonesia did not in any way participate within the preparation of the nomination file or obstruct it. No. Yes. So, so before the UNESCO nomination, so what was the social position of the dollars? I mean, were they just totally excluded from politics and where did they fit no. into? Yeah, no, I mean, because why is a basically, how I see it, it's a, it's, a, it's a communication tool, it's a medium. It's a way to tell stories, and you can tell all sorts of stories through Wayang. So it happens to be Mahabharata and Ramayana, because those are the main story cycles. But within those, these story cycles have always been used as a metaphor for contemporary uh, political situations. And, um, and what you see is that Wayang has always been used uh, for purposes like that. So um, you have uh, the court tradition, but you also have the popular tradition. The court tradition, um, uh, of course, has more guidelines, etc. The popular tradition emphasizes more the entertainment aspects. Um, there was always, uh, and Dalang are very free, so they are free to improvise and they're free to incorporate whatever story they feel is important to, um, to convey to an audience. Um, and what you see, uh, for example, after independence, after um, uh, after Indonesia became independent, is that there is a lot of experimentation going on um, with Wayang during the 50s and the 60s, uh, when Sukarno was the first president of Indonesia. Um, he really tried to find ways um, for nationalizing Wayang, um, experimenting with forms, experimenting with stories, uh, um, and also um, the PKI, for example, the Indonesian Communist Party, also experimented very much with Wayang to see how they could use, if they could use Wayang uh, for their purposes, and if how they could incorporate their political messages, how they could spread their political mes messages through Wayang. And also, during, for example, uh, the war for independence uh, between 45 and 49 mm -hmm. against the Dutch, um, uh, there was also the, uh, the genre Wayang Revolusi was created, which traveled, which was a traveling form um, of Wayang, about which we hardly know anything, but we only know that it was performed uh, throughout um, Indonesia to uh, to support and um, to support the troops and keep their energies and and spirits uh, spirits high. So, you know, there has always been this political interplay uh, with Wayang, this incorpor incorporation of political messages. During Soeharto, it became a little bit more rigid because he applied such a rigid cultural straitjacket. He also really um, uh, openly used Wayang to convey his political programs, etc. So, for example, um, his policy or his wish to um, um, decrease um, the number of children in, in Indonesia. So there was this program of that two children would be enough. So that was that was a political message that was spread through Wyoming as well. So there has always been this interaction um, and these interventions from uh, from the political side as well. So in that sense, it's 
it's not new, but what I think is new is now that it's an international organization that does this, and then is also not critical about the historical process that is behind uh, the the kind of um, yeah. Uh, so on the level of the individual, that will actually have any yeah. effect other than advertising. I guess. Well, I mean. On the one hand, it does. I mean, it, it does affect them because they do now take UNESCO as a frame of reference. So in that sense, I think it does have an effect. Um, and Dalang have al also, well, it depends on the person, right? On the individual Dalang, to what extent they are politically engaged or not. But yeah. So I don't know. It's not a yes or a no or very black and white, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if this is a, an answer to your question. Uh, sort of. I, I guess I... I don't know, I guess I thought that maybe there was some more concrete observation that we, you know, I mean, because it's so interesting that the, the Antus, yeah. then, you know, <laughs> became America's sounds or anything, but I mean, he could have been mayor even without this UNESCO. Yes, thing. yeah, 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 yeah. He could have been mayor without UNESCO because he's the only one of these three who never makes a reference to the UNESCO proclamation. Oh, really? Yeah, he doesn't do that. Yeah. Did he say why? No, no. He doesn't say why. Well, for him, well, uh, for him, it's not so important. He's like, yeah, okay. So I know that when I started my research, he wasn't even aware of it. He didn't know that why was proclaimed a masterpiece, and, and for him, it was not not really relevant. I think. So the other ones make make much more use of it, but he kind of really positions himself outside the established kind of frame for why in a, in a way, and he really does his own thing, and um, this is the result, basically. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, yes. If, if it comes under, uh, under the umbrella of the UNESCO with masterpieces, mm -hmm. does, that, does that curtail maybe some more, I mean, does that have to now stick to a more traditional um, performance narrative, or does that mean that people who kind of freestyle with tubby tubbies, um, yeah. does that, does that um, water down the kind of masterpiece? Um, mm. um, well, I think it does. I mean, not directly. So UNESCO doesn't say you can only do this or this. But um, but what you do notice, for example, now that UNESCO is really very much used as as a frame of reference. So whoever will read the nomination file, and imagine I, I don't know in fifty years or in a hundred years, you would the nomination file will be open and you would go through the nomination file and you would look at the description and then you see only five forms of Wayang being described and then you think, oh, there were only five form forms of Wayang. So that is kind of how documentation of performance practices work because it's just, you can, you can never, I mean, describing something, you can never grasp everything, so you always make a selection. So making a selection just means that you leave out lots of other stuff. And um, so in that sense, I think, uh, it's standardizing and establishing guidelines, not maybe in a very direct way, not in a very uh, explicit way, but in an implicit way, uh, for sure, it does. Yeah. <coughs> Any other questions? Is the documentation of uh, the, uh, the historical political, political you know, <coughs> the communist uh, way, Pick is, is, that, is that being done anyway? Not so much. There is this one um, uh, one publication that I know by Ruth McVeigh, and she really goes into how the PKE experimented with uh, uh, with different forms of Wayang, and even those discussions of uh, could the PKE even use Wayang because the PKE was a communist party, um, um, whereas actually the world of Wayang is very hierarchical, um, very um, feudalist, and all sorts of you know, those of issues where played a role in the discussions of whether the PKE could use Wyong as a, as a tool for political messages or not. But so there was, were all sort of things going on, but then 1965 already happened. So then the P PKE was banished and, uh, yeah. Uh, and yeah, lots of Dalang were also murdered. Um, so, yeah. That is where I, where that kind of experiment ended. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 
Just to, to, to go on from that, do you feel that the, the fact that so many Dalan and so much culture uh, that that kind of culture was destroyed in 65 yeah. has mm -hmm. had an incremental effect on, on the, the artistic form since. Mm. Okay, so uh, that is basically a topic of my next research. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, f I feel that, um, uh, so there's already really a, a, a vast body of literature on 1965-66, but they focus more on like the political sides and the, and the, and the violence and uh, and the structure of violence, etc. But there's not so much known uh, about the poli uh, the culture impacts mm -hmm. of the of the violence. So that is really under researched. Uh, I feel, yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it is. Okay. Yes, I will. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much.